Hello, everyone. Gary here from Timeline Astrology. This is the forecast for March 2024. So let's get into the transits. You see here the South and North Indian style layouts. We have a very powerful configuration in the skies from the end of February into the beginning of March. It is potentially quite explosive also into March and the first week and first half of March especially. This is because Mars is in exaltation in sidereal Capricorn. It is therefore in a square to its sign Aries where Jupiter and Uranus are coming closer and closer together. They will conjoin by exact degree in April. And there's a lot more going on in April, which I'll touch on in this forecast also, because it's worth mentioning. But we're going to feel the buildup even more, um, a sense of a buildup in March. And that's oftentimes the case with transits anyway. It's not always the exact conjunction where something happens. It's the buildup and then the eventual release. And then almost like the conjunction itself heralds the end of that whatever theme it, it signifies. So again, Mars exaltation, that is good and bad news, depending on your sign, depending on where in the world you are, depending on what is what is triggering in your chart. This could be very powerful for you personally, but also the great power comes great responsibility, all of that, because of course it's Mars exalted in Capricorn. Capricorn is ruled by Saturn. Saturn is ruling all of these planets here, moving through Capricorn and Aquarius, and it's aspecting the Jupiter Uranus in Aries, and so Saturn really has the last say in a sense. And as I mentioned in the February forecast, this, this is no bad thing because with Saturn restraining all of these more impulsive energies, it is tense for sure, especially as you can see here, Saturn and the sun are close. So Saturn is combust and the sun is, you know, obviously itself challenged by being with Saturn in Aquarius. All of this is tense and it's creating a tense situation, whatever way you're experiencing in your life. But it's still strong Saturn in another way. And, and that, I think, is saving the day because it, again, means that the strength of Saturn, i.e. of restraint, wins out. Now, having said that, it doesn't mean that there are, aren't many explosive events. And you can see there are many and probably even in your own life, you might experience some. But again, I do, do think that with Mars and Saturn so strong throughout this whole period and so impacting the all of the planets, really, these two what are termed malefic or cruel planets, as they're termed in Vedic astrology, makes life a bit tense. But when they're strong, it may be cruel, but you have the energy and the strength to overcome that cruelty. So, for example, if somebody's being challenged with Mars, exalted, yeah, you might be challenged to stand up for yourself, but then you do stand up for yourself and you feel better for it, right? That's Mars exalted. Saturn is so powerful, and so you might feel restrained in some situation that also requires you standing up for yourself. But then by restraining yourself and focusing your energy, then you also feel better about yourself that you maybe didn't say all of those things that you were going to say, but instead you use that energy to kind of push something through and to, to stand up for yourself without, you know, beating someone over the head with it kind of thing. So I do think there are very many strong transits going on, but in the globe, on the world stage, this is going to be obviously a challenge in terms of making peace with all of this and peace in general. Venus is here, conjoined Mars, and they both conjoined Pluto in February. Obviously, that's a lot of power struggles that are going on. And so peace is, is hard to win out here because Venus, which represents peace, is is under the thumb of Saturn in one way that's good again because it is showing restraint but it's together with Mars into the beginning of March and Mars is so powerful exalted so Venus doesn't really have a chance here as in peace doesn't have a chance really and you know all of these talks about ceasefires and so on it's like at least they're talking about it and the restraint there is there and we're talking about it but it's also not happening that's the thing. Uh, Mars is winning out. Now, by the first week of March and into the second week of March, we have Mars, you know, again, still aspecting this configuration here, this Jupiter Uranus configuration in Aries. And this is a bit worrisome. And again, if it weren't for Saturn aspecting, this would be, I think, already a massive explosive event. I think Saturn's aspect here as well is, again, and its rulership of Mars is holding it all back. Um, but still into the beginning of March, it's still, I think, something to be mindful of. You can see here Mars is exactly conjoined or sorry, squaring Jupiter 
from the end of February, but now it's going to start to square Uranus. That's more volatile, to say the least. Here's Mars at 25 degrees of Capricorn, and here's Uranus at 25 degrees of Aries. So this is explosive. I mean, I don't think there's any other way of reading this. It's explosive and it's, you know, a, an unpredictable result from doing something that's quite, yeah, focused maybe and deliberate, but then you have this unpredictable result. And if you're at least mindful of that by the 9th, 10th of March, that sort of culmination point, remember, it's going to lead to that. So there could be many things on the way there. Just to kind of um, be mindful of it, I think is helpful. Um, you'll see here things shifting as Venus then has moved into Capricorn or into Aquarius, leaving Mars in Capricorn. Mars is now almost exactly um, at its exaltation degree here by the second week of March. So by the mid-month period, as the Sun has moved into Pisces, we now have Mars and Venus moving into Aquarius, conjoining Saturn. So this is showing things shift by mid-month. I'll go back to the new moon that actually happens in Aquarius on the 10th now. And you can see how all of this is starting to shift from this new moon on the 10th of March in Aquarius. And it's quite a tense situation in, in, in a way. So the reason it is, is because it's a new moon conjunct Saturn, and then they're all hemmed in between Mars exalted on one side and Rahu and Mercury and Neptune all on the other. So it's creating this confusing situation likely as well, because Mercury's now in Pisces conjunct Neptune and Rahu, the North Node, that's very confusing. And then on the other side, there's this push on for something. So there's this squeeze that's going on now into the mid-month. And you're we're all likely to feel it, obviously. And this new moon is a reset. And that's all great. It's a new beginning. But it's a kind of new beginning that's been forced in a way, I imagine. There's things that have been forced through here, likely. So again, the strength of Saturn is to take a step back from all of this and not to be too impulsive and feel like you're pushed into anything and think about the long term here. Try not to lose sight of that. The fact as well that after this new moon, we're heading into a new lunar month, which has within it the full moon and eclipse in Virgo, which I'll get to by the end of March. This shows obviously that not only does this feel kind of pushed through and sort of forced through and things are being you know, tense at this time. But then also subsequently things start to change un in unexpected ways that you hadn't even accounted for. So again, another reason to kind of keep an eye on the sort of bigger picture here with Saturn especially. So especially for a new moon conjunct Saturn in Saturn sign Aquarius and in a sign which is all about making progress. Again, just think about the consequences of the things that you're doing now, of anything that's happening at all, whether you're doing it or not. And think about the long-term implications. And this is what this new month is all about. Again, like I said, Mercury is going into Pisces. And then Mars will go into Aquarius, joining Venus and Saturn. And you can see here as well, Mercury has already conjoined the North Node here by the 18th or so. This is leading to the next phase into April when we experience a total solar eclipse here in Pisces. Before then, we have that lunar eclipse in Virgo, which is going to kick things off. But everything starts to kind of slip and slide and start to feel a bit uncertain in another kind of way, where, again, things have changed maybe dramatically in our lives, in some area of our life, at least, and in the world at large. And then the consequence of that leads to other unforeseeable circumstances that creates further changes that yet, that might might be subtle initially, but then create changes in another way. And that's what the eclipses always suggest, that there isn't always an obvious change that happens in everybody's life, in everywhere, you know. There are some, obviously, key changes that will happen, but everybody is affected by them in one way or the other, in subtle ways that sort of leads to changes in the future because the eclipses are primarily, or at least initially, psychological. They are not planets that can be seen. They're shadow planets, as they're called in Indian astrology. So they're like this psychological dimension that creates these different um, you know, viewpoints and insights. And basically it's a shift in perspective, in perception, 
and it creates changes subsequently because of that change in our psychology. So oftentimes, though, it does actually create changes in our environment, and especially when it's conjoined planets in our birth charts, changes happen for us. But with this eclipse coming up in April, and I'm mentioning it now in March, because even though we don't have it until April, we do have a lunar eclipse in March, which I'll show you here. So on the 25th of March, we have a partial lunar eclipse with the south node Ketu in Virgo in a very exacting sign with a very exacting shadow planet, Ketu, the south node. And when you combine those together, this can be almost like hypercritical, you know, and wanting to focus in on the details so much, but at the same time, maybe even not dealing with the issues or not actually, it's almost like picking up an issue and then looking at all the problems of the issue and then sort of like, oh, saying to hell with that and dropping it and walking away. This is the kind of Ketu kind of in Virgo kind of signification, potentially. This full moon and a partial lunar eclipse is obviously that. That's the potential. So we need to be mindful of using this for what it's best for, which is solving problems, getting rid of issues, dealing with the details and figuring things out, joining the dots and allowing the insights to bubble up into our awareness for this full moon on the 25th of March, and then be able to implement that and not walk away from it. So you've been given an issue, there's a problem here or a solution to the problem maybe, and deal with it. And that's the best expression of this eclipse, I would say. Um, and, and it's a very productive sign and it's a lunar mansion that's very productive. Hasta is the name of this lunar mansion in the middle of Virgo, which is literally meaning hand. So it's like manifesting something, making something, you know, managing something, maybe even micromanaging this case. And to do that and to use that energy of this lunar eclipse. And to also accept that obviously it's not going to go as planned. It's quite obvious that during this eclipse, and if we look at where Mercury is, which rules Virgo, in Pisces this whole time in the month of March, and by the end of March, it's reached the very last degree of Pisces, about to move into Aries, and then about to retrograde in Aries and go back into Pisces. Obviously, whatever you start here, whatever you do at all, when you think about the eclipses and then the Mercury retrograde, Whatever you do, it's not going to be clear and the details are going to be very sketchy. So this is another reason why you might look at it all and then want to throw it all up in the air and walk away from it. I would just, again, encourage you to perhaps look at it closely and try and solve some issues here without getting too impulsive and reactive, especially around this full moon on the 25th of March. Now, this full moon on the 25th of March then again opens up that eclipse window, as everyone says, and it's this kind of analogy of this kind of time of change is you're opening up the windows and the winds of change are blowing through the house and everything kind of gets kind of, um, you know, all the papers are thrown up in the air with this gust of wind. It's like everything has to settle down after this period. But initially you have to let it sort of just do its thing, you know, and there's a sense always with eclipses within the two eclipses, especially a sense of urgency that we feel. And again, it's it's psychological. It's all psychological. The eclipses are psychological. We start to feel the urgency. It's not necessarily true that we have to actually do anything, but we feel like we have to do something. And then we then do something perhaps. And then we do it irrationally or impulsively. And we have to be mindful of that. Now we also have to consider maybe that that is part of the bigger picture, that our impulsive reactions to something leads to something else that leads to something else that is meant to happen. So, that's what I would say about this period after this full moon. We can see here as well that as soon as the moon joins planets here in Aquarius, Pisces, Aries, we're going to have a situation by April where all of the planets are lining up in just three signs. And that combined with the eclipse, a total solar eclipse, no less, in Pisces, and with all of these planets either side, all gathered up into three signs, is quite a volatile combination. And not only that, but the fact, and I'm mentioning it now again, because even though this is the March forecast, we're going to feel it into the end of March and into April. This April eclipse on the 8th of April, which is a total solar eclipse, the new moon in Pisces, is the new lunar year in the Hindu calendar. So it actually is said to mark the energy for the whole year ahead until the following April 2025. And when you have this kind of eclipse situation going on, together with all the planets lining up in just three signs, 
and Mars and Saturn conjoined almost by degree and Jupiter and Uranus conjoined almost by degree, either side of a new moon in Pisces and a total solar eclipse. And on top of all of that, a potential visible comet, a comet arriving into our skies in this section of the zodiac also, by the way. It could be very dramatic indeed, and I don't want to overplay this. I don't. I'm, I'm, but at the same time, I don't want to underplay it because it could be quite a dramatic sky in April, a total solar eclipse, and then a visible comet that could get quite bright. Even if it didn't get quite bright, it's like quite symbolic: an eclipse and a comet coming together at the same time. That hasn't happened since I was reading about it. Um, I think 1997 was the last time this occurred, where the um, comet in March of that year was two weeks before a an eclipse, a solar eclipse in April. And what I was looking at in 1997 was trying to look at maybe some significant events that happened around that time that were quite meaningful and, and big and the world took notice. One of the main things I, th I think that happened in 1997 was the death of Princess Diana. Um, it's not unusual when you have an eclipse anyway, and then also you throw in a comet, that there's going to be some one like removed from power, maybe let's not say somebody dies, but let's just say somebody is like in a government or in a, maybe a position like royalty, perhaps where they're being taken out of power or they're removing themselves or they're abdicating or whatever, or, you know, I don't want to be specific about what may happen because there's a lot that is potential here for this upcoming April eclipse. But I, I do think that something big is likely to happen, but Apart from all of that, the fact that all of the planets are going to, and I'll show you this eclipse now, just to give you a sneak peek ahead. This is the 8th of April. This is the new moon in Pisces. And this is, again, Saturn, Mars conjunct and Jupiter, Uranus conjunct. Mercury has been retrograde from the 1st of April, will continue and back into Pisces and conjoin the eclipse itself by the 25th of April to station direct. You know, it's one thing after another here in April, really. It's, again, the eclipse, all planets lining up in three signs, the comet, then a Mercury retrograde throughout this whole period, backing up into the eclipse and conjoining the eclipse, the north node, Rahu. It's going to be very confusing indeed, the events that are going to unfold in April, I feel. And there's going to be a lot of tension. But this three sign lineup is called a Shula Yoga in Vedic or Indian astrology. This is tense. It is said to create a lot of warlike situations. It is likened to the trident of Lord Shiva, the destroyer, and it's sharp. It's, you know, it's courageous also, though. This is another thing about it, that it creates very courageous situations that where we have these powerful configurations that make us, you know, deal with the issues that crop up in our life. But it's also quite volatile and it creates a lot of like battles it creates a lot of warlike situations more warlike situations and they're in our own personal lives as well like fighting like just getting into situations where we're fighting with people so we just need to be really mindful when they, then you also throw in a comet and unexpected eclipse all of these things coming together and then also a mercury retrograde on top of all of that from april 1st then we're just not sure about anything that's happening and especially then when mercury goes back into as you can see here from the day after the eclipse on April 8th, from April 9th, it goes back into Pisces. It's Mercury retrograde conjunct Rahu, the North Node in Pisces. The mind is going to be overwhelmed. The mind is not going to be able to cope with all of these things that are happening. It's going to be confused as hell. It's going to be very hard to make decisions around this April period. And especially, like I said, until at least Mercury stations to go direct. But even then, it's still in Pisces until getting into May. So really, until we get to May, there's a lot happening and there's a lot of things that are con going to confuse us and create a lot of tension in our lives. And when we're feeling tense, when we're stressed, when things start to pile up and we haven't dealt with things, maybe, and then it's like it all kind of comes to a head, but then things start to happen that are unexpected. Also, the mind cannot cope with all of that because it's like the mind doesn't operate very successfully when we're stressed. And we're likely to react strongly to all of these things and not make good decisions. So if you're mindful of all of this, I would just allow these transits to do their thing more so and to try and take a step back and to think of the strength of Saturn again and to think about the bigger picture here. Always think about the bigger picture in March and April. 
And then you're probably going to do yourself a, a greater service and other people by not being so strongly reactive and maybe creating more problems. So that is quite a month. I mean, what more to say about it, except that I do think that the changes that are happening are all meant to be, that we have to remind ourselves of that when especially a lot of changes start to happen. I will talk more about it next month, of course, in the April forecast, because we need to talk more about the Mercury retrograde and what it's doing, and also the eclipse itself, what it's doing, because that's going to do something for the next year. And the chart of that, and I'll show you the charts of that next month, are important to look at all of the big themes of the year ahead. So I hope you enjoyed that. If you are not already a patron, you can sign up as a patron at patreon.com forward slash timeline astrology or, or just go to timeline astrology. I'll just show you what you get as a patron. You get lots of things. You get daily reports in your email, but also you get a monthly report and you can read all about that. And I'll show you that here. This is a monthly report on everything I mentioned there, but just in more depth talking about all the transits for the month, the new and the full moon, that eclipse full moon. And yeah, you get that every month. We also ha have a meeting every month where we discuss all of the transits. And when we come together, we have more in-depth discussions. Of course, the Q&A sessions are always more, I think, in-depth because when, uh, when questions are asked, that, that means we have to go deeper. We maybe get more specific about people's charts if they bring their charts. But whatever it is, I think it's a good way to engage with the astrology by talking about it, by talking about your own experience about it. Even if you don't have a question, you might want to share your own experiences. So that's a monthly meeting that we have this month. It's on the 3rd of March. Um, and that 3rd of March period, um, it's 7 to 8 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. Um, where we'll meet and again that's all for patrons so consider joining up in the meantime i wish you all the best of course for the month ahead i hope some of that if not all of that helps you in some way and until next time